All right, fantastic. So um, I hope you enjoyed the poster session. And now we have our next talk. Um, our next speaker is Professor David Horan. Um, and whilst he has retired from being head of the Cognitive and Systematic Muse Musicology Laboratory, laboratory he is still a very active member of the research community with awards such as a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Society for Music Perception and Cognition in 2017 and a Lifetime Membership Award from the Society for Music, Therapy, Music Theory in 2019. David has a keen interest in exploring why music is so enjoyable and appealing as well as assessing the influences of preferences and culture. He uses a variety of methodologies in his research, including behavioral, computational, and anthropological. He also has published two books, one being Sweet Anticipation, Music and the Psychology of Expectation, 2006, which assesses the rule of expectation in music emotions. This book has received more than 2,400 citations, which is an outstanding number. So thanks, David, for being with us. Uh, thank you. So uh, first of all, let me uh, add uh, my thanks to the Canterbury organizers, and especially to you, uh, Mir Homayun, and, uh, and also to Andrea Halpern for making this uh, conference possible. I think, uh, especially uh, in the age where direct opportunities here to learn from each other are, are rather restricted, this opportunity, I think, is very, is very good. And I also applaud the, uh, the opportunity for people who have uh, travel difficulties, either through mobility or finances. It's nice that there's such a, a large group of people that are, are able to, uh, to access this information and participate. Um, my presentation is in the form of a video, which we'll play in, in a minute here. Uh, that's also uh, on Vimeo, but it will be part of the uh, YouTube uh, documentation for this. Um, my work on uh, music, uh, emotion, and ethology uh, uh, derives a lot from signaling theory. And uh, there's a taxonomy that I have, a five-fold taxonomy of uh, spontaneous signals, spontaneous cues, uh, and uh, voluntary signals and cues, and uh, also some uh, cultural signs. Uh, in the 45 minutes for the video, there's not a lot of time to talk about many of the other things, so I suspect the video will raise many more questions uh, than it answers. And with that, I think let's uh, roll the video, shall we? Emotion research has been in considerable disarray now for several decades. Competing theories remain in locked combat, including basic emotions theory, behavioral ecology, and psychological constructivism. For those of us interested in music and emotion, it's unlikely that we'll be able to sort out the specific musical problems until the more general problems with emotion are resolved. In this presentation, I propose to bootstrap a new conversation that draws on the field of ethology, the study of animal behavior and in particular, one component of modern ethology, so-called signaling theory. The view here is similar to Alan Fridlin's behavioral ecology theory with some important differences. My aim in this presentation is to show how insights from ethology can help move the conversation forward. By way of preview, my presentation will address four topics. I'll begin by reviewing two crucial problems plaguing emotional research. I'll then continue by presenting some foundational concepts in ethology that provide, I believe, helpful ways of resolving these problems. I'll then continue by applying this ethological way of thinking about emotions to two classic problems in music-related emotion. Both of these problems relate to the paradoxical enjoyment of negative emotions. Specifically, how is it possible that some people can enjoy listening to nominally sad music? And how is it that some people are able to enjoy listening to nominally aggressive music like heavy metal. Ultimately, my claim is that ethological theory offers a more comprehensive, parsimonious, and biologically plausible account of emotion and affect-related displays and behaviors. The problems in emotional research begin with a confusing relationship between felt emotions and behavioral displays, such as facial expressions. We observe, for example, that people smile when feeling happy, people giggle or laugh when they feel playful, and people weep when feeling grief. The problem is that people also commonly smile when they're stressed. People will giggle or laugh when they're nervous or fearful. And people will weep for joy as well as weeping due to grief. 
So what does it mean to smile? Does a smile indicate happiness or stress? Does laughter signify playfulness or nervousness? Does weeping denote grief or joy? In fact, weeping arises under lots of different circumstances. Weeping is commonly observed among happy winners of beauty pageants. Weeping is also commonly evoked by the feeling of pain. Weeping is frequently observed in situations of religious piety or ecstasy. Of course, people often cry at weddings. Weeping is observed in temper tantrums, where it's largely motivated by feelings of anger or frustration. Feelings of patriotism can also bring people to tears. It's not uncommon in situations of extreme humor for people to laugh so hard that it brings them to tears. Famously, female fans of the Beatles wept in the presence of their adored stars. And of course, listening to music is also able to bring many listeners to tears. This surely means that weeping itself signifies no fixed motivating emotion. Without additional information, it's not clear that weeping is an expression of grief, for example. The loose relationship between behavioral display and motivating affect isn't limited to weeping. People smile when happy, but also smile when feeling stressed, uncomfortable, embarrassed, shy, polite, or socially apprehensive. These observations suggest that it's essential to distinguish display behaviors from the presumed motivating affect. So the first problem here is that there seems to be no consistent relationship between an emotion-related display and the presumed motivating emotion. There's a second problem that also relates to the relationship between emotions and their purported expressions. There are several emotions that appear to be linked to specific displays, including fear, anger, joy, and disgust. Famously, Paul Ekman conducted cross-cultural research that broadly suggests that these displays may be universally recognized. Unfortunately, the pertinent research is marred by methodological issues and small effect sizes. However, there's an even more curious issue about the relationship between emotions and their displays. And that's the fact that most emotions have no distinctive display associated with them at all. What are the facial expressions for envy, regret, pride, loneliness, nostalgia, suspicion, affection, boredom, or compassion? Even basic feeling states like hunger and thirst are not evident to observers. Given the importance of the feeling of hunger, why is it that hunger isn't displayed or expressed in some obvious way? So in summary, among the many requirements a theory of, of emotion must address, a good theory needs to explain why a single emotional display, such as weeping or smiling, can arise from many different motivating emotions. And it also needs to explain why only a handful of emotions are associated with distinctive behavioral displays, such as unique facial expressions. Ethology, I propose, offers a helpful answer to these questions. Ethologists make an important distinction between signals and cues. This distinction has become a central pillar in modern studies of animal communication. A signal is a functional communicative act involving innate behavioral and physiological mechanisms. A good example of a signal is a rattlesnake's rattle. The rattle is used as a warning device, such as when the snake encounters another animal that could cause it harm. The rattle effectively says, I'm here, don't harm me because I could also harm you. The aim is to avoid unnecessary conflict or injury. Notice that the signal benefits both the rattlesnake and the other animal. By contrast, a cue is a behavior that incidentally conveys information. An example of a cue is the sound of a buzzing mosquito. The buzzing sound alerts us to the likelihood of being bitten, something we've learned through past experience. Like the sound of the rattlesnake's rattle, the buzzing of the mosquito conveys information, alerting us to the possibility of being attacked. However, the source of the information differs. In the case of the rattlesnake's rattle, the communication is a functional behavior on the part of the snake. The snake's interest is best served when the signal is perceived and recognized by the observer. In the case of the mosquito's buzzing, the communication is accidental, an unintended byproduct of the need for the mosquito to flap its wings. Unlike the rattlesnake's rattle, the information conveyed by the buzzing sound is actually detrimental to the mosquito. Determining whether a particular behavior is a signal or a cue isn't a straightforward task. Nevertheless, there are some common attributes that help ethologists to distinguish them. First, signals tend to be conspicuous rather than subtle or concealed. Since the effectiveness of a signal depends on communicating to an observer, there's no benefit to timidity. 
good signals should be obvious. By contrast, cues are simply artifacts of other behaviors. Cues convey information, but this information is incidental to the behavior. As a consequence, many cues, though not all, are vague or modest. Related to the property of conspicuousness is a second attribute. Signals are more likely to be multimodal. That is, signals tend to involve more than just sound or just visual elements. In the case of this bear, for example, one can imagine a sound that goes along with this distinctive facial display. Since signals work only if they are communicated to an observer, it's useful to employ more than one perceptual modality. Back to the case of the rattlesnake, the snake lifts its tail in the air and shakes it. So even if you can't hear the rattle, you might still be able to see the distinctive wagging tail. Or if you can't see the tail, you might still hear the rattling sound. Of course, cues can also be conspicuous and involve more than one modality. But the conspicuousness of a cue doesn't arise through selection pressures. That is, cues are not designed to be conspicuous. A third attribute of signals is that they often employ purpose-specific anatomical and behavioral elements. In the case of the rattlesnake, there's a specially evolved anatomical organ, the rattle, which doesn't serve any other purpose. A fourth characteristic feature of ethological signals is that they change the behavior of the observing animal to the benefit of the signaler. In the case of the rattlesnake, the purpose is to prevent another animal from harming the snake, such as incidentally stepping on it. The observer will tend to withdraw and avoid the snake. Signals normally result in predictable, stereotypic responses by the observer or spectator. This is an essential characteristic of signals. A fifth property of signals is that they also benefit the observer. In the case of the rattlesnake's rattle, the observer benefits by avoiding the snake, which reduces the likelihood of being bitten. So it's not simply the case that signals change the behavior of the observer to the benefit of the signaler. Signals change the behavior of the observer to the benefit of both the signaler and the observer. This mutual benefit can be illustrated by considering another example of an ethological signal, the behavior known as stotting. Stotting is observed in a number of species, including deer and gazelles. Stotting features repeated leaping as high as possible into the air with the legs held stiffly. Crucially, stotting is performed only when the animal detects the presence of a predator. When selecting possible prey, predators typically focus on weak, injured, or ill animals. Stotting effectively demonstrates the health and vigor of the animal. Cheetahs and African wild dogs have an instinctive disposition to ignore stotting animals as potential target prey. Notice that the signal benefits both predator and prey. The predator benefits by recognizing that pursuing the stotting animal is likely to be futile. The stotting animal benefits by avoiding a prolonged chase and by allowing the animal to return to vigilant grazing. Incidentally, it's the mutual benefit for both signaler and observer that provides the selection pressure, allowing the stotting signal to evolve. Notice that if the signal weren't beneficial to the signaler, then there'd be no reason to make the signal. And if the signal wasn't beneficial to the observer, then there'd be no compulsion to respond with an instinctive behavior. So let's consider an example of a human signal, the case of weeping. Without going into detail, weeping is conspicuous and involves multimodal elements, including a distinctive facial expression and distinctive vocal sounds. Weeping also involves a unique anatomy and physiology, including a special nerve that innervates the lacrimal sacs, which is used only to generate emotional tears. Weeping typically leads to a notable change of behavior in observers. When we see someone weeping, we tend to experience a broadly prosocial feeling. We're likely to offer assistance, suspend any aggression, feel a sense of connection or bonding, or otherwise experience a favorable attitude towards the weeping person. The weeping person benefits from the assistance that observers typically offer. Now, if weeping is a bona fide signal, then we'd also expect the evoked behavior to also benefit the observer in some way. So what are the benefits of helping someone? The value of altruistic behavior is well-trod territory in evolutionary biology. Evolutionary theory posits at least five means by which altruistic acts can be biologically beneficial. In brief, they include benefits from kin selection, reciprocal altruism, enhanced status with respect to the weeping individual, enhanced social reputation within a wider community, 
and the avoidance of social punishment for failing to be helpful. The benefits of altruism are so great that we should not merely respond when people request our help, we should also seek out opportunities to help, even in the absence of requests for help. That is, a person doesn't need to cry in order for us to benefit from offering them assistance. In understanding behavior, it's important to distinguish so-called ultimate from proximal motivations. In the case of food consumption, for example, the ultimate purpose of eating is to maintain metabolic resources, but the proximal motivation for eating behaviors is the enjoyment of eating. In the case of weeping, the ultimate incentive to weep is that it encourages observers to come to our assistance. When we observe someone weeping, the ultimate motivation to engage in helping behaviors can be found in kin selection, reciprocal altruism, and so on. What's important to understand is that in our subjective experience, we live in the world of proximal motivations, not in the world of ultimate biological motivations. It's the proximal feelings like hunger that motivate us, not abstract goals like maintaining metabolic resources. When we cry, our weeping doesn't feel like some clever way of manipulating other people in order to commandeer resources for ourselves. Instead, when we cry, our experience is typically dominated by a profound feeling of loss arising from an unhappy human condition. Similarly, when we see someone crying, our phenomenological experience is not one of gleefully helping, confident that the person is incurring a great debt to us that may be repaid later, or that our social reputation will receive a welcome boost. Instead, our proximal motivation is to be found in human sensitivity to the plight of others. The evolutionary scenarios are opaque to us. So in the case of weeping, what is the proximal feeling that encourages us to engage in acts of altruism? The answer is the feeling of compassion. We help others not because we want to build social capital, but because we feel pity, sympathy, or compassion for the crying individual. What's important to understand about the feeling of compassion is that it's a positive feeling state. In the first instance, there are many historical accounts where observers have noted that acts of charity are not truly altruistic, precisely because they make us feel good. These arguments can be found in the writings of St. Augustine, Thomas Hobbes, Immanuel Kant, and many others. Apart from the many anecdotal accounts, the pleasures of charity have also been documented in several neuroimaging studies. Specifically, brain regions associated with pleasure are activated when participants decide to donate money or otherwise resolve to engage in altruistic acts. Moreover, we can experience pleasure merely at the prospect of a possible future feeling of compassion. That is, people can take pleasure merely by being given the opportunity to engage in future acts of compassion. The main point here is that compassion is a positively valenced emotion. So our story here is that weeping is an ethological signal that commonly evokes feelings of compassion in observers and that the ensuing prosocial behaviors typically benefit both the person weeping as well as the observer. Now this might seem like a plausible scenario when a person weeps because they're experiencing grief, but as we noted earlier, there are lots of other circumstances where people weep apart from grief, such as tears of joy. So the critical question is, how well does our signaling scenario fit with the many other forms of crying? Perhaps the most interesting case is that of the weeping beauty pageant winner. Why would someone who is likely experiencing joy weep? The effect of weeping is best understood if we contrast weeping to gloating celebration. Suppose the response of a beauty pageant winner was akin to the triumphant boasting of a boxing champion. Turning to the other contestants, she thrusts her arms into the air and declares, I am the greatest, or tough luck suckers. In the double standards world in which we live, personality counts for something in beauty pageants. We want our winners to be magnanimous, generous, self-effacing, not self-centered or egotistical. In our ethological account, the purpose of the weeping is to evoke pro-social feelings of compassion in observers. As observers, her weeping evokes in us feelings of wanting to be helpful and supportive. As the winner of the competition, she could take steps to establish an aloof or unapproachable persona. On the contrary, instead of gloating, her weeping amounts to a powerful declaration of humility. Whether the weeping is motivated by grief or joy, 
or any of the other weeping circumstances we identified earlier, the effect of the weeping is to induce a broadly prosocial disposition in observers, feelings that lead to reduced aggression, the offering of altruistic assistance, a feeling of connection or bonding, or simply a favorable attitude towards the weeping individual. Although there are many emotions that might lead to weeping, weeping tends to evoke a much narrower range of responses in observers. Indeed, the induced response in observers amounts to a single stereotypic emotion, namely compassion. Although this illustration pertains only to weeping, it turns out that this pattern is characteristic of signals in general, including smiling, laughter, aggression, and so on. That is, the range of emotional responses induced in observers of a signal tend to be much more constrained than the many emotions that might lead someone to generate the signal. We tend to think of weeping or smiling as reliable indicators of a person's emotional state. However, our examination of weeping raises serious doubts about this common presumption. When we encounter someone with tears in their eyes, in the absence of other contextual information, the tears tell us little about what the person is feeling. A reasonable guess might be that the person is experiencing grief, but that conclusion might be entirely wrong. By contrast, we have a better chance of correctly inferring that an observer of weeping is likely to experience a feeling of compassion. As I'll emphasize later, the emotional state that is most reliably predicted by a signal is that of the observer, not that of the signaler. Let's return to our second emotional puzzle. Why are so few emotions associated with distinctive displays like facial expressions? Ethological theory raises an important question regarding the communication of emotions. As observers, knowing someone's emotional state is very useful for predicting their future behaviors. So why broadcast one's emotions to an observer? Biologists note that there can be significant costs incurred when communicating one's feelings. For example, if I'm able to recognize that someone is angry, this allows me to prepare in advance for a possible assault. At the same time, the angry person loses the potential advantage of a surprise attack. A classic illustration of the cost of information is evident in the game of poker. If you are dealt an exceptionally good hand, a happy facial expression is not to your advantage. From an ethological perspective, it makes no sense to wear our emotions on our sleeves. In the business world, it's understood don't give away information unless it's to your advantage. Although the information may seem innocent, you never know how your competitors might be able to make effective use of it against you. When you think about it, the only reason why one should communicate anything is that it's likely to change the behaviors of those around you to your benefit. As Dawkins and Krebs convincingly argued, the purpose of any display behavior must be to manipulate the behavior of the observer, not to provide information to the observer. Now, you can't simply expect others to change their behaviors if it's to their detriment, as in a zero-sum game. The act of communication is going to be most effective when there's some value for the other person as well. That is, the most effective communicative displays are those that produce benefits for both the displayer and the observer, and that's exactly the function of an ethological signal. This way of thinking about emotion-related displays offers a notable contrast with the most widely assumed model of emotion, what might be called the emotion revelation model. The idea is that there exist emotional expressions, such as smiling, frowning, weeping, laughing, etc., that communicate our emotions to others. The emotion revelation model might be summarized by the following logic. I feel happy. This causes me to smile. You observe my smile and you infer that I'm happy. Although this scenario is widely presumed in nearly all theories of emotion, it is problematic for the reasons given above. The key question is, what is to be gained by revealing one's emotions? Returning to Ekman's basic facial expressions, signaling theory suggests that these are not expressions of emotions at all, but are ethological signals. If they're indeed signals, the polygenic theory suggests that any of these displays could be motivated by a variety of different underlying emotions, including no emotion at all. You don't need to feel happy in order to smile, feel grief in order to weep, or feel playful in order to laugh. Moreover, if they're signals, it also means that the display must benefit both the displayer and the observer. For example, if a nominally aggressive facial display is a signal, then it must be beneficial both to the person making the display as well as the person observing the display. 
Let's suppose that the reason why she's making this display is indeed that she's feeling angry, perhaps because you've stolen her food. The aggressive display here might presage the possibility of an attack. Of course, any altercation or fight has the potential to cause either one or both individuals to get injured. So even if she's stronger than you, it'd be beneficial for her not to have to fight you. If you assess the situation as one where she's ready to fight, and if you think she's stronger than you, then you'd likely return the food to her. The benefit for her in making the display is the return of her food. The benefit for you is that her display has forewarned you of the possibility of a fight and that you have consequently avoided potential injury. In short, her display of aggression benefits both her and you. If she didn't make the display and simply launched into attacking you, both of you would be taking a risk of injury. Notice that if she assessed you as being the stronger individual, then it'd be foolish for her to make an aggressive display since that might invite you to hurt her. But failing to make the display wouldn't necessarily mean she doesn't feel anger. Having assessed that you're stronger than she is, she could very well feel anger without showing any overt sign of that feeling. An ethological approach suggests that it would be useful to revisit each of the purported basic facial expressions and reinterpret them as signals. Instead of viewing them as efforts to communicate an emotional state, we consider how the display might induce observer behaviors that benefit both the signaler and the observer. Having addressed some foundational concepts in ethological signaling theory, as promised, I'd like to spend the remainder of my presentation addressing two long-standing paradoxes in musical aesthetics. Both paradoxes have to do with the challenge of negative emotions. Specifically, how is it that people are able to enjoy listening to nominally sad music, and how is it that people are able to enjoy listening to nominally aggressive music, like heavy metal? First, let's consider the case of sad music enjoyment. There is, of course, a substantial literature on this subject, and I should note that my discussion here will focus on work from a just-published Frontiers article produced with my collaborator, Jana Voskowski. Perhaps the most important observation regarding sad music is that not everyone enjoys it. Several different studies suggest that only about half of music listeners enjoy listening to sad music. The wide individual variation suggests that the enjoyment of sad music is most likely to be related to either differences in past experience and or trait personality differences. Current research does indeed implicate personality differences. Earlier research had linked the enjoyment of sad music to openness to experience. However, more recent research indicates that the main personality trait predicting sad music enjoyment is empathy, and that the earlier results were confounded by shared variants. The most developed model of empathy is Mark Davis's four-factor model. In the enjoyment of sad music, three of Davis's four factors are implicated, empathic concern, personal distress, and fantasy. By empathic concern is meant the disposition to feel concern, sympathy, or compassion for another person experiencing some stress or misfortune. This might be summarized by the statement, I feel sympathy for you. Personal distress is the disposition to echo or mirror feelings of personal anxiety or unease when witnessing stress or tension in others. This might be summarized by the statement, I feel your pain. And finally, fantasy is the ability to be absorbed and imagine the feeling state for fictional character. One might summarize this by the statement, I can imagine that situation. For simplicity, we'll use three shorter labels here. Empathic concern is indicated when I feel sympathy for you. Let's call this the feeling of compassion. Personal distress is indicated when I feel your pain. Let's call this the feeling of commiseration. And fantasy is indicated when I can imagine that situation. We'll simply call this fantasy. Compassion and commiseration have contrasting valences. As we noted earlier, research indicates that compassion is a positively valenced emotion. Commiseration, by contrast, is negatively valenced. Sharing someone else's pain is, well, painful. So what do we see in the case of listeners who enjoy listening to sad music? A number of studies have investigated the relationship between trait empathy and the enjoyment of sad music. Jona Wyskowski and her colleagues found that participants who most enjoy sad music score high on fantasy and empathic concern, with no association for personal distress. Said another way, participants who most enjoy sad music score high on fantasy and compassion, 
with nominal levels of commiseration. Summarizing in yet another way, sad music lovers experience elevated levels of I can imagine that and elevated levels of I feel sympathy for you with only nominal levels of I feel your pain. These results have been replicated in several subsequent studies, including studies with Finnish, Austrian, and Japanese listeners. If listening to sad music evokes more compassion and less commiseration, then the overall experience is positive. Conversely, if listening to sad music evokes more commiseration and less compassion, then the overall experience is negative. In order to better explore the relationship between sadness and enjoyment, Wuskowski and Erola carried out an experiment that specifically explored the pleasure evoked by sad music. Key to this study was a mediation analysis that endeavored to trace the causal connections between sadness, being moved, and enjoyment. The analysis showed that felt sadness contributed to the enjoyment of sadness-inducing music, but it did so by intensifying feelings of being moved. That is to say, being moved was pivotal in order for listeners to enjoy nominally sad music. If being moved and compassion are synonymous, then the mediation analysis can be interpreted as indicating that the causal train is not sadness evokes enjoyment, but sadness evokes compassion, which in turn evokes enjoyment. Although there's much more to say about the enjoyment of sad music, the main outlines are clear. Sad music lovers experience only moderate levels of I feel your pain, but high levels of I feel sympathy for you. A parallel paradox to the enjoyment of sad music is the enjoyment of aggressive music, such as found in the case of heavy metal. As you might suppose, heavy metal emulates many of the acoustical features associated with aggressive vocalizations. The question is, how is it that these sounds might be enjoyable? Once again, as in the case of sad music, not everyone enjoys listening to aggressive music. In a study by Bill Thompson and his colleagues, they found that metal fans commonly experience positive feelings of power and joy when listening, but non-fans commonly experience tension and fear. So let's consider portrayals of aggression or anger. A useful parallel here can be found in the Maori haka. Most people are familiar with this as a traditional pre-game ritual performed by the New Zealand All Blacks rugby team. Traditionally, hakas were performed by warriors before battle as a demonstration of aggressive strength. On the one hand, the aggressive display has the potential to intimidate an opponent by inducing fear or trepidation. At the same time, the haka also offers a bonding experience for the team members, inducing a sense of collective power. In our earlier discussion of anger, we noted that one can feel anger without making an aggressive display. If you've stolen my food and you are much stronger than I am, then it would be foolhardy for me to express my anger to you. People make aggressive displays only if they feel powerful enough to prevail should a fight ensue. Notice that if you happen to be a fan who roots for the All Blacks, you're likely to appreciate and enjoy the haka display even though you yourself aren't a participant. In short, even some observers can vicariously partake of the feeling of power associated with the haka. In our earlier discussion of sad music, we saw examples of two types of induced emotion in observers a contagious feeling of commiseration, and a repercussive feeling of compassion. In the case of observing a haka, the contagious emotion would be where the observer also gets a feeling of power. The repercussive emotion would be where an observer feels fear or trepidation. A simpler way to describe this would draw on the linguistic distinction between first-person and second-person utterances. When I feel that the expression or behavior is mine, then the expression or behavior is first-person. When I feel that the expression or behavior is being directed at me, then the expression or behavior is second person. If, as an observer, I identify with the aggressive display, then I'm likely to partake in a feeling of anger, aggression, or power. If, on the other hand, I don't identify with the behavior, then I'm more likely to feel fear, foreboding, anxiety, or tension. We can certainly recognize that feelings of anxiety or trepidation would be unpleasant, that is, negatively valenced. The question now is whether the feeling of anger is positive or negative. Anger has traditionally been considered a classic negative emotion. However, current research suggests this is wrong. Both behavioral and brain imaging studies suggest that there are two different forms of anger. We might call them displayed and undisplayed anger, or alternatively signaled and unsignaled anger. Signaled anger, or hot anger, is displayed and arises when a person feels powerful. 
unsignaled anger or cold anger remains covert. We simply fume in private silence. We don't display our anger, not merely because we are helpless to do anything about the situation, but also because an expression of anger is apt to result in retaliation if the observer is more powerful than we are. In both the signaled and unsignaled anger scenario, the cause of the anger is the same. For example, you might feel angry because someone has stolen your food. The loss of food is assessed as negative, but we should be careful not to confuse the valence of the event that precipitates an affect with the valence of the ensuing affective state. There are circumstances where anger is positively valenced. In behavioral economics, for example, there are excellent studies showing that people will incur a significant cost in order to punish moral transgressors. People will pay to see someone punished. A good example of positive anger is righteous indignation. The positive feeling evoked by righteous indignation was discovered by the commercial media some decades ago with the invention of talk radio. Each show leaves listeners fuming at those damn idiot politicians. The fact that audiences tune in day after day is testimony to the positive feelings evoked by righteous indignation. Once again, it's important to distinguish the cognitive assessment of the precipitating situation from the valence of the evoked feeling. We are angry because we assess the situation negatively, but the evoked affect depends on whether we feel a sense of superiority or power. The epitome of anger-induced good feelings occur when righteous indignation leads to acts of successful revenge. Incidentally, in animal behavior, positive and negative valence is linked to approach versus avoidance behaviors. Undisplayed anger leads to avoidance or withdrawal, which is symptomatic of negative affect. But displayed anger leads to approach behaviors, symptomatic of positive affect. Note that displayed anger is symptomatic of the feeling of power and control over one's circumstance. At this point, you might be able to anticipate how we might account for the polarization between those who like or dislike aggressive musics like heavy metal. Like the haka, if you are a member of the team or identify with the team, you are likely to take ownership of the aggressive expression. It is also your expression, and you are likely to feel empowered, the sort of anger expression that is positively valenced. However, if you're a member of the opposing team, or if you fail to identify those performing the haka, then you're less likely to experience positive feelings and more likely to feel negative affects like fear or tension. A former colleague of mine once mentioned to me that he'd been a heavy metal fan in his youth, but that he no longer listens to it. I asked him what had changed. He responded to me by saying that he was no longer an angry young man. Like weeping, an aggression display has all the hallmarks of an ethological signal. In signaling theory, we can ask what emotions might motivate the signal, and we can also ask what emotion is likely to be induced in an observer. We can also ask how the signal benefits both the signaler and the observer. As we saw in our earlier allegory about the stolen food, an aggression display can benefit the observer by encouraging the observer to rectify the situation leading to the anger, such as returning the stolen food. The benefit to the observer is the avoidance of a possible fight, or minimally the forewarning of an impending flight fight without more onerous possibility of being the target of a surprise attack. In the case where the signaler is more powerful than the observer, an aggression display will benefit both individuals. In summary, the research suggests that there are two forms of anger. Feelings of anger may or may not induce an aggressive signal. An aggression display makes sense, however, only if we are more powerful than the observer. It would be foolish to produce an aggression signal if it invites retaliation from someone who is more powerful. So aggressive displays arise only when we assess our position as one of power. Recall that a positive feeling of power was the most common emotion reported in Thompson and colleagues' study of heavy metal fans. And also recall that tension and fear were the most common emotions reported by non-fans. In the case of the aggressive displays evident in heavy metal music or ritual hakas, we see that bystanders can sometimes identify with the signaler and consequently partake in the associated positive emotions without having to generate an aggression signal themselves. Once a distinction is made between first and second person perspectives, the positive and negative affects observed in reaction to heavy metal music are readily explained through ethological signaling theory. 
In the remaining time, let's summarize and review the main points of my presentation. Ethologists make a useful distinction between signals and cues. Signals are functional communicative acts involving innate behavioral and physiological mechanisms that change the behavior of the observer to the mutual benefit of the signaler and observer. Signals tend to be conspicuous, multimodal, stereotypic, and result in stereotypic responses by observers. Signals evolve only when the interaction benefits both individuals. That is, signals can evolve only in non-zero-sum conditions. Most interactions occur in zero-sum situations where one individual's gain is another individual's loss. The relative rarity of non-zero-sum conditions is the reason why there are relatively few signals in a given species' behavioral repertoire. It also explains why there are many more emotions than there are emotion-related displays. When the non-zero-sum condition is met, the mutual benefit to both individuals provides the compelling selection pressure or evolutionary engine that ultimately creates and sustains the signal. The mutual benefit also accounts for the innateness and automaticity of the behaviors of both the signaler and observer. Incidentally, it is this automaticity which explains why signals may occur in the absence of an observer, such as when a person weeps, laughs, or smiles when alone. As an intensely social species, Homo sapiens have a larger repertoire of signals than most other species. At the same time, we have greatly expanded neural resources for inhibiting, suppressing, or masking otherwise compelling behaviors. Consequently, we can better grit our teeth and not cry, or better resist the feeling of wanting to help someone who is crying. Although signals can be evoked by various emotions, signals typically evoke a single stereotypic emotion in an observer. Signals themselves are not emotions. Emotions act as motivational amplifiers. We're more likely to act in a particular way in the presence of an emotion than in its absence. Deciphering the emotional states of others is highly useful since emotions are predictive of ensuing behavior. Conversely, indiscriminately revealing our emotions to others is apt to be maladaptive. Most emotions are covert or private with no distinctive display. Examples include feelings of loneliness, affection, hunger, anxiety, suspicion, nostalgia, regret, pity, envy, and pride. A subset of emotions are loosely associated with certain displays, including smiling, weeping, laughter, and aggression. However, the relationship between display and emotion is not one-to-one. -one. Many emotions can lead to the same emotion-related display, such as smiling when happy or stressed, or weeping arising from feelings of grief, pain, joy, humility, anger, or laughter, and so on. What's highly predictable is not the emotion that led to the display, but the emotional state that's evoked in the observer. Nearly all theories of emotion wrongly assume an emotion revelation model in which emotional states are communicated to observers. These models are biologically implausible. Ethology provides a better account. Emotion-related displays such as smiling, weeping, aggression, fulfill all the criteria for ethological signals. It's important to distinguish displays from affects. Smiling and weeping are displays. Grief and joy are affects. The purpose of an emotion-related display is not revelation, but manipulation. For example, my smile is not intended to communicate to you that I'm happy or stressed or submissive. Instead, my smile is intended to change your behavior to our mutual benefit. Basic emotion theorists have mistaken ethological signals for emotions. The emotional state that is most accurately predicted from an emotion-related display is that of the observer, not that of the displayer. For example, weeping by itself tells us little about what a weeping individual is feeling, but virtually all observers are likely to experience compassionate pro-social feelings toward the weeper, whether the weeper is feeling grief or joy. The unifying function of a signal is to be found in the behavior of the observer rather than the signaler. In understanding emotion-related displays, researchers have mostly been looking at the wrong person. Once we recognize that overt displays like smiling and weeping are ethological signals, then it follows that most, perhaps all emotions, are private or covert, as theory would predict. Consequently, emotions are not expressed, they're deciphered. 
That is, the work needed to recognize an emotion is done almost exclusively by observers. Most weeping arises due to grief, so it makes sense that we might assume that weeping indicates grief. But that conclusion is just a good guess based on past experience and contextual cues. The weeping itself doesn't convey that specific message. Emotional valence is easily misconstrued. Situations that provoke anger are always negatively assessed. However, the anger itself can be positively valenced, as in righteous indignation. People commonly misreport valence because they confuse cognitive assessment of the cause of the anger with the induced affect. It's long been recognized that much of music's emotional impact can be traced to a voice music homologue, where the music emulates prosodic features of the voice, such as found in displays of sadness or aggression. An important question in music emotion research is the extent to which these music prosodic features lead to similar cross-cultural responses. Ethological theory tells us that a key to understanding this question lies in distinguishing signals from cues. Since signals are innate, those musical passages that emulate signals have the greatest likelihood of evoking similar listener responses across cultures. However, there aren't many signals in the human behavioral repertoire. So the types of musical passage that evoke similar responses cross-culturally are likely to be limited in number. It should be noted that shared listener responses can also arise in the absence of innate behaviors, as when different cultures share similar social or physical environments and so learn similar patterns of response. Although it's common for signals to evoke contagious emotions, where the affect motivating the display induces a parallel affect in the observer, in the case of signals, the most commonly induced affect in the observer is repercussive rather than contagious. Hence, sad music is more likely to induce compassion than sadness, and aggressive music is more likely to induce tension or trepidation rather than anger. Finally, signals are typically multimodal, so sounds are as important or more important than facial expressions, postures, or other modalities like smell. Throughout the animal kingdom, when a signal re relies on just one sensory modality, sound is favored over visual displays. Unfortunately, emotion researchers have tended to fixate on facial expressions. Ethology tells us that emotion researchers need to pay much more attention to sound. In bringing my presentation to an end, I should note that limitations of time mean that several critical issues have been ignored here. There's been no time to discuss voluntary versus involuntary displays, cognitive mechanisms of resistance and inhibition, and the many other ways in which culture amplifies, modifies, or circumvents signal and behaviors. Also, there's been no time to situate the ethological theory I'm proposing within the long-standing seesaw between basic emotions theories and psychological constructivism. For those who are interested, several of these issues are addressed in the papers referenced at the end of this video. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, David. We've had a number of questions. We have about uh, 10 minutes for questions now. And so I've had a set of questions that I think um, revolve around a similar theme, which is about the context of these interactions. So uh, one questioner sort of asked about um, culturally determined sort of ritualized weeping and uh, the individual refers to um, Kuali and Transylvanian gypsy musicians. Uh, another person um, in somewhat similar asked about the context of sort of um, whether gender as a co cultural context might modify some of these interactions. And in generally, some people are asking about, is there some nurture, if you will, involved in what this has been primarily presented as a nature kind of view of these emotion, uh, how we interpret these emotional displays? Um, yeah, can you hear me? Am I, yes. am I on? <laughs> um, uh, so uh, this uh, video basically dealt with just one of a taxonomy of five different types of ways of emotion related displays. 
So in talking about signals, yes, the claim is a strong claim of innateness. However, um, cues are a different story. And moreover, um, there, uh, there are voluntary versions of all of these. So uh, the classic example here is in the case of smiling. So there are spontaneous smiles or the Duchenne smile, which has a, an involuntary basis for it. But of, of course, we also make use of smiles in social contexts where we have a social smile that's a, a voluntary smile, which we're, which we're doing. And there are voluntary versions of all these signals. So uh, I, I can do a voluntary disgust. I can do a voluntary laugh, ha, 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 ha. You recognize that those are not spontaneous, that, um, that they're motivated by an intention to want to produce a signal, a signal-like display uh, in a context in which the signal doesn't um, uh, spontaneously ar arise. And there are culture, and these, these things are culturally mediated. So a very good example of this is uh, uh, the, um, something called the welcome of tears amongst the Tupanamba Indians in Brazil where when they meet strangers in the forest, the, the classic greeting is to do fake weeping. So if I were in, encountering a complete stranger in the forest, the, my response would be <laughs> I do that for you know, 30 seconds or so and then I would stop. And it's, it's done in an explicit way that uh, it's what impressed Europeans when they first observed this was how fake it was. They recognized that it was, was completely fake. Um, so in a sense, what's being communicated in that situation is um, in, in a crying situation, it's, a, it's essentially a situation where you're saying, if those were spontaneous, I, I need help. And in a, in a situation where you're meeting a stranger, uh, this could be a recipe for disaster. You could be uh, enslaved, you could be killed, you could have things <laughs> stolen from you and so on. Uh, and and uh, we know from all sorts of other research that one of the best ways to deal with that is to reduce this, the, um, the potential here for aggression. And then one way of, sig of, of, of indicating that is by, by pretending to weep. And this says, I'm basically helpless here, and so don't, don't, don't attack me. At the same time, the very fact that it's clearly a voluntary statement says, oh, and by the way, I'm not really helpless. So, um, so this communicates something more interesting. And then a, a fifth, a, component to the taxonomy would be uh, cultural signs. So these could be things that, um, you, you know, in some cultures, uh, this the movement of the head back and forth on the horizontal plane is saying, you know, no, I don't dis I disagree with this, or I, I'm disgusted, we can do this, this is a cultural signal. In other situations, um, this would mean the same thing. So, um, so th those are clearly culture, culture bound. So I, I think, you know, unfortunately, I didn't really frame the video by saying I'm only dealing with one component of these five, this five taxonomy, these, the um, uh, innate signal component to it. Okay. Another question, again, I'm grouping some questions. Several questioners were interested. Um, uh, this is framed primarily as an interaction of one person with another person. And several people were asking about the group cultural, con the group context. So uh, I think the, that Hakka uh, triggered a few comments about, oh, isn't this also group solidarity and I'm part of the team? And a couple of other people refer to it indirectly. So mm -hmm. uh, do we have another layer here that this is um, partly going into the connection of the either us against them or the general sort of group identity? I, I think, uh... Uh, emotional contagion is is one of the unsung heroes of a lot of social interaction. Um, you know, a classic example here would be uh, uh, famously Native Americans did uh, a war dance before they would attack a, another another group. You could imagine if if we were the Hopi and we were thinking about attacking those Apaches over the hill. Um, first of all, we're going to have a discussion as the Hopis, and, and presumably there are going to be some people who don't think it's such a good idea. But one of the things that'll happen if, if we have a war dance is we'll kind of get on the same page. And every, you want to have that emotional contagion where everybody is going to act as one, e even at the expense of the possibility that the Apaches are standing up on the hill looking at these Hopis and sort of saying, what are they doing that? Doesn't that sort of look like a war dance? I wonder, you know, you'd think that a war dance is a stupid idea because it kind of gives away the possibility of a surprise attack. That the very fact that it exists suggests that the power of the emotional contagion is more important than the potential of actually uh, 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 conveying a message to some other group that you don't want to have conveyed to. 
Yeah, so it can be very powerful. It can be very uh, powerful. Uh, another questioner um, asks whether the um, this change of my uh, getting these signals and inducing behavior and attitude change in others is there also perspectives that induces attitude changes in myself for instance the the questioner particularly talks about self-compassion one can imagine other emotions there are times when really i should be more angry at myself than i really am etc uh i not that you've ever experienced that uh, but <laughs> is there uh can we can we envelop changing our own uh using this to to control our actually our own attitudes and behaviors yeah, I, I think there's a whole other area about uh, sort of mood regulation and uh, cognitive use of emotions. I, th I think one of the things that clearly sets humans apart from other animals is that we have so much more cognitive resources. I, I alluded to that in the video by saying things like the ability to inhibit, modify, or, or mask uh, uh, certain things, but, but also to induce certain kinds of states as well. And I wouldn't underestimate the complexity of what uh, humans are capable of doing in that regard. I think we have time maybe for one more short question. Uh, there were several um, uh, several aspects about what should a composer take away from some of this. Again, I'm collapsing several questions. That are there things that a composer should keep in mind as he or she tries to write in aggressive or other kinds of musicking? Uh, I, I think it, it may be premature to be able to say that there's any kind of advice that would be useful to uh, practicing musicians. I think what has to happen is we need to go through all of these different affects that have been chronicled, you, you know, in the, uh, like the Yuslan Alauka paper and so on, where there's these long lists, and, and use ethological theory to identify those components that really conform to ethological signals, those that conform to ethological cues, and those things that we probably conjecture are really strongly uh, cultural signals and, and other things. And it's only the ethological signals that ethological theory would suggest are going to have a transcultural, uh, any possibility of transcultural communication. Yeah. And one question in particular, I wanted to know if you had advice for heavy metal composers. <laughs> Keep on making music. <laughs> All right, I think, uh, do we have time for one more, uh, Amir, or do we need to do our switch over? Yes, so one more minute. Oh, one more minute, okay. Um, and I think, let's see, well, you've gotten many thanks, and I think uh, very briefly, Ah, would you go so far as to saying that we could actually uh, use some of these reactions to music as personality tests? Uh, yeah, actually, I've thought about that. I mean, it'd be interesting. Um, it, it, it does seem like an implication. My, my suspicion is that the effect sizes are pretty small. I wouldn't be surprised. One person did make a, a wry comment about how L. Ron Hubbard seems to have uh, been talking about some of these things from a completely... Oh, no. <laughs> but I will let you see the comments. So thank I guess you. we want to uh, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. And thank you, uh, thanks, thanks applause, for all the And I guess we're going to do a switch over to our last talk of the day, and then we'll all go to the pub. <laughs> or not. <laughs>